Okay. Um, so we are we're gonna we're gonna get going. I think we've got a good number of people on the 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 call. So I'll um, start us off and um, just say hello to everyone. Um, thanks for thanks for joining this webinar. Um, this is the the second one in uh, this week's series of of webinars on FTAP as as prep. Um, our call today is going to look specifically at um, at a trial that's being planned by Gilead of, of FTAF in, in cisgender women. Um, so really excited to kind of dig into to that piece of this conversation. Uh, my name is Stacey Hanna. I'm the Director of Research Engagement at, at AVAC. Um, and I'm joined today by two, uh, two really great speakers who are gonna kind of, I think, help walk us through two different sides of, of this trial, but, um, and I'll, I'll introduce them in just a second, but um, first of all, just to give sort of a bit of introduction on, on exactly what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, and I think, you know, this introduction is probably, these details are probably familiar to, to most people who are attending this call, but just to kind of set it up, I think we were all watching very closely on um, October 3rd, when FDA gave its approval of, of FTAF for PrEP, um, and also looking, looking very carefully at the caveat that the label actually excluded people who, uh, ha who have receptive vaginal sex. Um, and you know, there's been a lot of discussion because of that about um, about about why exactly the the decision uh, came came down that way. Um, but the FDA did actually also approve in in their approval letter included a requirement for Gilead to uh, conduct a post label trial to obtain necessary uh, safety and efficacy data in cisgender women. Um, and so this, which is which is good news on a on a certain level, but I think it's it's caused quite a bit of discussion because Gilead had previously said that a trial in 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 women just wasn't feasible of of this product. Um, so what we know now about this this trial that's coming up is that. Uh, they're planning kind of a new sort of innovative design. Um, and I think one of the things that's sort of exciting um, and challenging about where we where we are in this is that uh, we also know we're sort of getting into an era with HIV prevention research where um, trial design is actually becoming quite complex uh, because the landscape of, of prevention is improving so much. And so this is um, not only sort of an important conversation around FTAF, in and of itself, and sort of the product development pathway of that of, of that product, and what what's sort of happening next for women, um, but it's also a really interesting conversation in terms of the kind of evolution of, of trial design in our in our field. Um, so we also know um, that this trial is um, has, is being planned quite quite quickly, um, and it, it, it's being planned to begin in 2020. We know Gilead is looking at um, at South Africa and potentially other um, other countries in Africa. Um, and so our two speakers today are gonna are gonna uh, you know talk about again just different aspects of of the trial. Our first speaker um, is is Jeff Murray, who is the deputy director of the division of antiviral products at the U.S. Uh, Food and Drug, Drug Administration. Um, and Jeff has spent a lot of time. Uh, I think many people know he spent a lot of time really thinking about um, HIV prevention trials and specifically how we're developing next generation prep products in the era of um, of effective effective prep. And and actually has. Um, spent some good time kind of helping advocates explain this and, and, and really um, uh, helping, helping advocates understand sort of where they can kind of weigh in on, on this conversation and, and these decisions. And so um, he's going to be talking to us um, specifically at the, the de uh, specifically about the design that, that Gilead is, is thinking about. Um, uh, and it's, again, as I said, it's, it's, 
it's innovative, it's new, and so hopefully we can um, we can unpack that a bit together today. Um, and then our second speaker is Yvette Raphael, who um, Yvette leads a civil society organization based in South Africa called the Advocacy for a for the Prevention of HIV and AIDS. Um, and she really has been a, a leading thinker in in following HIV prevention research, and is going to um, is going to talk to us a bit about um, what civil society and what advocates in South Africa are kind of thinking and, and feeling about this trial, about FTAF for women, about FTAF for African women, um, and really specifically about community engagement in the trial. And I think um, in all of the sort of the conversations and to, in you know some of the frustrations around where we where we stand with FTAF right now and FTAF for women in this upcoming trial, there's really been a clear call um, to for community engagement, and um, we at AVAC we always say it's 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 easy to say, but a lot harder to do. And um, Yvette is is going to help us understand what that might look like. Um, so, without further ado, um, I'm going to hand it over to you, Jeff, to to take us through your presentation. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm having a little bit of connectivity issues. So um, I just lost my Zoom. Oh, it's back on the Zoom. So are you displaying my slides? I can't tell. Yes, they, they're up there on the screen. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so I included about, so everybody can hear me. I've included about seven slides from um, distilled down from a presentation I gave at IAS in Mexico City in July. And um, so on the last slide, I think uh, Gilead's statistician um, was taking notes because at our advisory committee, um, he basically, in responding to questions, uh, indicated that they would be pursuing a kind of a trial design that has elements that you'll see on, on the last slide of my slides here. And um, I guess one could say it's new and innovative, but re, you know, really nothing is new in the world and it's been kind of borrowed and, and repurposed. It's probably new for HIV prevention, but it is, it, it is based on, on other kind of drug development clinical trial design. Um, and then that, that's why I threw up in the, the first slide, uh, you know, the FDA regulations cite different, five different kinds of controls that you were familiar with, placebo, no treatment, dose comparison, active and historical. And um, just want to say that active controlled trials with non-inferiority comparisons rely on historical information as do historical controls, and they both suffer from biases. So to, to have a non-inferiority trial, we have to go back to the trials that were previously conducted with the active control compared to placebo. And that's been a real problem because of adherence, and it's been difficult to predict exactly how much efficacy you're going to get, uh, even out of Truvada, depending on the, the population. So the constancy of kind of the treatment effect that Truvada will have because of adherence, it's, it's not very constant. And, and that's one thing you really need for non-inferiority trials. So uh, active controlled non-inferiority trials. So um, I've been saying that uh, for HIV prevention trials, uh, non-inferiority trials may be no more rigorous than other historical or external controls, but yet they bind us to infeasible trial sizes, even when you can do them. Um, and, you know, Discover was recently completed as a non-inferiority trial, um, made the non-inferiority margin, um, but they could have very well not made it with just a, a few more HIV zero conversions on Discovy. And um, if, if you calculate what the current HIV zero conversion rate is going to be, I mean, the trial sizes are going to be, be huge, um, you know, up to 20,000. So can I have the next slide? <clears throat> Um, so again, I said, you know, this really where we're go where <laughs> I was inspired by the oral contraceptive trial design um, kind of paradigm, and so you know, a thieving from another area, 
And um, generally, for oral contraceptives, okay, so we're both talking about outcomes from, you know, a, you know, a, a sexual experience, something. Um, they're, they're generally single-arm trials. Sometimes they're active controlled trials and oral contraceptive when they want to compare uh, safety with an old oral contraceptive. They measure something like HIV seroconversion rate. They measure pregnancies per 100 women years. Okay, that's a way to summarize contraceptive effectiveness. Similar, similar to what we kind of how we measure HIV seroconversions. Um, typically, oral contraceptives have less than one to two pregnancies per 100 patient years, or, and um, the standard is based on kind of historical evidence that we're confident that pregnancy will occur reliably high, and oral contraceptives that are now being studied are really good. So next slide. And I show this uh, in, a, in a diagram, and I think it's, it's a concept to kind of show over and over because <clears throat> it's helpful to think about how we could have a parole index for HIV prevention trials. So the historical pregnancy rate in women that are commonly selected for or enrolled in these trials is around 80, 85. If it was 70, 60, it wouldn't really much matter because our efficacy threshold is way down at the other end. We're expecting a, a contraceptive failure rate of only one or two pregnancies per 100 patient years. So there's this is an area, I mean, you can use external controls, historical controls, when you've got kind of a, a wide difference between what you expect your efficacy to be and what you would expect the rate to be had there been no intervention. So next slide. <clears throat> And so, uh, just to kind of reiterate, the essential components is uh, a contraceptive failure threshold. So you have to define uh, what an acceptable failure rate is for pregnancy. I mean, you know, we don't typically want to prove oral contraceptives that give you 20 or 30 <laughs> pregnancies per 100 patient, uh, women years. Um, and you need to have you need to know what the pregnancy rate is without contraception in the in the population you're you're studying, and that your confidence that the difference between the two is really large to use a historical reference. Um, next slide. And so, th this is the inspiration. So, what about a parole index for HIV? Well. The difference is, you know, we think it's possible, and this whole kind of scheme is based on it, but it has to, have, but there has to be some guardrails around this, because HIV incidence is much lower than a pregnancy rate that we would be expecting, for instance, in oral contraceptive trials. It is variable and very population dependent, um, and it's sometimes difficult to predict HIV rates using only baseline factors or patient history, although that's a possibility. Um, so, for a reliable HIV, high HIV incidence, you must have a population with risk behaviors and a high prevalence of potential transmitters, and where the two meet, you'll, you'll get the population that you need. So, you have to find that population on the other end. Um, next slide. And so, here would be kind of a comparison between an HIV index and a PEARL index. So. Um, I, our high HIV incidence populations, you know, kind of at best are around five, okay, in the recent ECHO trials, it was around four, and, you know, HIV MSM trials in the past, it's, you know, ranged from four up to, uh, I think, uh, Proud was up to, what, seven or eight, or it was way up there. Um, but you see, we have a lot less room to work with for HIV than we do pregnancy pregnancy but given now that we think that you know Truvada discovery these oral agents can be very very effective and, and basically in people who adhere it bring down the HIV infection rate to something negligible there still might be be room but I think in order to do this you kind of need two things and I don't think this trial design would necessarily work for something like dapavirine gel because you need you need something a stringent infection what's acceptable for an infection threshold on treatment it's like i really want treatments that are you know 90 percent effective and are going to result in very low infection rates 
And the other thing you need it to you need to enroll um, people who have uh, you know a high or will have a high HIV incidence without PrEP. And um, been pretty good about finding MSM in areas. I think um, in women in Sub-Saharan Africa, we can find this HIV incidence. And the thing is being able to anchor what this, what they, we call a counterfactual, what the HIV incidence would be without PrEP. And um, since it's a little tri tricky, I had suggested um, using two methods to uh, calculate what the HIV incidence should have been without PrEP in the trial that's going to be, would be enrolled. And examples would be epidemiologic data, uh, using sites that, you know, previously had high in, in, HIV incidence. Um, other things we've been exploring with MSM is predictions based on STI rates observed during the trial, because at least in MSM there may be some, there may look like there's a correlation between rectal GC and HIV, which makes sense. Um, so using th these other kinds of methods to estimate HIV incidence. One other one good one that I'd like to see developed would be these uh, recency assays. So when you're screening for the trial, uh, <clears throat> try to get an HIV incidence based on um, the number of people who had recent HIV infection based on some of these uh, HIV recency assays. That can also give you an estimate uh, of what the HIV incidence is in that population. So next slide, and I think this is the final one. Yeah, okay. So here's kind of a trial design com a proposal. So we think we still want an active control. I think that the, you, you can have feasible trial sizes using an external control because um, to do a non-inferiority trial it requires a a, a large of you're, you're you're basing your estimate of treatment effect on old historical rates which you know included effectiveness rates of 40 50 percent so it, it just jacks up your sample size we still like active control trials with ftdf or a current standard of care as an internal uh, benchmark comparison because I, I think people are still interested to see you know uh, is the new agent really off? It, you know, are, are there really any obvious differences between the two? And, and that would allow also for a safety comparison of the two regimens and, you know, estimates of HIV seroconversions, but not power for traditional non-inferiority. Um, then one would define a stringent threshold of an acceptable rate of HIV infection. You might want to define an acceptable difference between the new agent and the old agent. Choose trial sites with high-risk individuals based on epidemiologic and other data, and then use, as I said before with the diagram, two or more methods to estimate HIV incidence off PrEP or the counterfactual, and I, and I already gave some examples. So the trial that Gilead is proposing in their PMC, and I, and I must say that the protocol has not yet been submitted to us, and so the devil is always in the details. Um, but it includes, I think, all of these elements that um, <clears throat> it's going to be powered at, at for uh, a comparison with HIV incidence using external controls. Um, that allows you, uh, A, not to have to do some kind of placebo-controlled trial necessary or superiority to, to placebo. Um, it allows you a smaller sample size because you don't have to do a non-inferiority trial. So those are the two benefits from that. Also, though, it will still maintain a randomized control to the standard of care for a, a more descriptive comparison of how the two compare to each other. Um, one can also, and we haven't really talked about this, and that needs to be polished, you, you could also increase that sample size to define, you know, if you thought a difference between the old and the new agent was, um, th that would be out of bounds that you wanted to rule out, you could, you could incorporate that into this trial design as well. And, um, you know, in order to have this trial design, like I said, you need highly effective agents and a high and very high risk population. 
and um, and at the end of the day, um, you, you kind of have to show evidence of both. And uh, so that's that's the basic gist. Now, so this trial design is for uh, agents that you expect to be comparable to FTDF. So this would be you know something you know perfect for FTAF. Um, you know, another oral agents where you're not expecting it to be better than FTDF and you're not expecting, you know, an adherence advantage by route of administration. I'm not, not to say that superior trials can't still be done if you have some advantage with adherence. So long acting vaccines, et cetera, you could probably still do some superiority to active control over time if you consider that people adherence would wane over time and and you could pick up superiority um, by that route um, but I think even with those trials I think it's always good to have as in a backup um, in case all arms perform really well these external controls <clears throat> and I think um, having um, comparisons to in the advisory committee for the discover trial having um, external controls available to look at <coughs> for discover um, helped reassure us on the efficacy of discovery given that the uh, HIV incidence rate was so low on both arms presumably due to adherence so I've delivered a lot probably <laughs> of kind of complex information. So I think I'll, I'll stop there and um, I don't know, I guess we can talk about it or entertain qu questions. Um, but I think, you know, this is, this is where the Gilead trial design, I think, came from. And, you know, it will be a first, we'll have to see how it goes. You know, I, I don't know if it's going to be a winner or not, but to be honest with you, I can't think of any other option. I don't think any of us could think of an, another option at this point. Thank you. Um, I think a very tantalizing um, way, way to end, Jeff. Um, but thank you for walking through that. Um, and we are going to take questions. Sorry, I should have mentioned before you started. Um, uh, after, after we hear from Yvette, we, we will have time for discussion. So want to encourage people to um, send in your questions in whatever way you 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 would like. Um, there's a Q&A and a chat function on Zoom. If you would like to chime in when we get to the discussion part, um, just um, let us know um, and we can unmute you um, and, and you can chime in and we would we would love to, to hear from from anyone on the call. Um, but we ha we do have a number of questions already coming in. Um, one thing and we're gonna wait, I'm gonna turn it over to Yvette and then we'll do a discussion in time, but I did just want to clarify before I move on, Jeff, um, in, in talking about this design, and do you think that the, um, that the trial that Gilead would be proposing, would it also include an active control? Um, I, I just wanted to clarify kind of based on what you presented. Yeah, so there will be a randomized comparison to FTDF, and I think that is in the approval letter in the P PMC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. post-marketing commitment. So it's powered for and you know, statistically designed for the comparison against the external controls, but there will also be a comparison with FTDF. And um, at this point, I, I don't know how, with what precision we'll be able to make the comparison to FTDF. And th that's kind of a judgment call to, uh, you know, how, how, how precise do you want a comparison with this internal benchmark control FDDF? Mm -hmm. I think what they were planning to do um, was maybe a two to one randomization on that. But again, we haven't really worked out that level of detail with the protocol yet. They just have a, you know, a, a, the general concept that, that they were going to use both external controls primarily, and then this internal uh, active control with FTDF. Mm -hmm. And, and, and again, sorry, just to clarify, so our understanding has been that the internal kind of active control would be for the, for the, primarily for the safety data, but that the external hypothetical would be for the efficacy. Is that sort of a fair way of thinking about it? 
Well, um, I'm hoping that it will be more than just safety because f for me, I think, um, you know, we have a lot of safety on, on FTAP and really what we want to know is if uh, we want to rule out a situation where, um, you know, FTAP was clearly performing unacceptably more poorly than FTDF. So, um, uh, I want a certain level of precision around the HIV zero conversion rate comparison as well. Okay. Okay. No, that's super helpful. Thank you. Um, great. So I am going to go ahead and um, turn it over to Yvette. And Yvette, again, we're really excited um, to hear from you and to hear um, some more about kind of the, the community and civil society perspectives on this, specifically coming from a country where, um, where they're talking about um, implementing this trial. So over okay. to you, Yvette. Good morning, afternoon, and evening in some parts of the world. I know this call is good people from everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks. And I, I just need to uh, say that initially my first reaction when the news broke about the SCOVI and, um, and the results as was just, you know, not uh, trying to quote our great uh, young activist, Greta, how dare they? How dare um, we do research without women and young women in Africa where we carry the burden of this disease? Um, and our initial, my initial reaction is, was also to get advocates and activists in South Africa to hear from them how they understand their feelings and thoughts around this study. So although we somehow excited of a possibility of a new drug, we need to register that initially when this trial was done, women were left behind. Um, so we um, convened a round table with ad advocates on the 7th of um, November, led by the Advocates for Prevention of HIV, as well as uh, supported by ABEC. The purpose of this meeting was uh, exactly to discuss the priorities for 2020, FTEV, the DOPOL, and HIV integration. Um, we, we had a lot of discussion, so I'll just give a brief of what was discussed and where we see this going specifically with the uh, study that will happen in South Africa, because I don't see how we will get to the high incidence and the high numbers if we don't involve South Africa. So more than, more than 20 advocates then at this round table, we talked about what has worked so far. So advocacy and advocates has been part of trial research and supporting trials and um, advocating for GPP for a very long time. And one of the things that we spoke about and wanted to take stock on is what have we done so far? What has worked for us and what has worked for the trials? And um, one of the highlights was advocates uh, organizing themselves and leading the research narrative, the formation of the global CAB, the global CAG for in support of the ECHO trial, as well as the EFRO CAB that led to WHO guidelines for DTG. Um, so it's clear that advocates, uh, advocate led and advocate advocate has the uh, cap capability to organize themselves in the in our countries what has not worked for us has been the funding and budgeting for real community engagement that has been always been a pipe dream for us engaging communities and advocates where studies are happening from the conceptualization to the results uh, results dissemination and also the transformation of the research sector specifically scientists that needs to be representative of representative of the communities where the studies are happening specifically talking about black young and female what are our issues with this current study and what we're looking forward to is that this new trial is being rap uh, is being planned rapidly to happen in south africa with the timeline of less, not less than a month how will advocates be engaged from conce uh, conceptualization the complex and new trial is then that is very different from what we, have, we are used to as HIV activists or pre HIV prevention advocates. How will the capacity of advocates be, be built? FTA for women and women in Africa would increase a choice as well as options for women. So there is a need 
So we're not saying we don't want this trial to happen. There is a need for such trial and eventually for this product to become available and accessible to women in Africa. Ultimately, we want women to have access to FTAP and advocates' engagements throughout this trial is necessary to ensure that. We know our communities have been part of trials and this trial can benefit from an in-country-led independent engagement mechanism that is not reliant on the product developers or a research institution. So our, our call is for, if this study is happening in South Africa, for us to start the engagement and there is no later time than now. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Yvette. And I, you know, I think it's just exciting to hear. Um, I, I think um, we've all really been paying attention to sort of the 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 fast the fast track that this trial is on, and that Gilead is kind of taking. And it's a bit of a double-edged sword because we think that there is pressure um, for them to move quickly and to collect uh, collect you know these data and women you know, as quickly as possible. Um, you know, I think just responding to the the sort of the disappointment and like you said, the sort of how dare they that the, the, the labels not not included women, but the flip side of that is that this is this is gonna be a complicated trial and they you know then there is needed time to make sure that there's preparedness sort of all around. Um so really glad that, that you all are coming together and, and talking about this and I think that it's really gonna kind of pave the way for um, for for some good engagement, um, hopefully, <laughs> fingers fingers crossed. It's it's always harder than it than it seems. Um, so I think we've got some some good time to to get back to questions. And as I mentioned, um, there have uh, been a few, um, you know, that have come in um, uh, in in various ways. Um, so I I think where I um, would like to start, and this is maybe I think. Um, Jeff dire directed to you, but Yvette, I think you could chime in as well. Um, you know, I think one of the, you know, one of the things obviously that's sort of at the top of everyone's mind is sort of how did we, how did we get here? So I think, Jeff, if you could kind of give a little more sort of explanation for the, the rationale of not including um, cisgender women in the original TAP trials, why that, why, you know, in, I mean, you, you talked about some of the challenges, but if you could dig into that a little bit more. Um, and I think one of the things that as advocates, people who are following all of this relatively closely, one of the things that we're wondering is, you know, we do see that there is a superiority trial happening right now for Cab LA and women, and how is it that that is possible, but the, the trial in FTAP you know, the sort of comparator trial um, for FTAP was, was not possible. So maybe we could just start there. Uh, well, I think that we could have done a trial like Gilead proposed and probably should have done, started that around the same time as Discover, but I don't think that there was consensus among clinical trial design experts and statisticians at the time. And, I, and to be honest with you, there still isn't. That's why we're still having a lot of these discussions and we haven't worked out all, all the, the kinks. Um, it was kind of not possible to include women in the DISCOVER trial because the DISCOVER trial was a non-inferiority trial and um, <laughs> There's, you know, it all goes back to kind of um, some more kind of complex statistical trial design issues. But to do a non-inferiority trial, you have to you have to calculate what they call a non-inferiority margin. That margin is how well the active control performed in previous trials. So for MSM trials, we um, all, we always had in the placebo trials. We always had a, a treatment effect, a statistically significant treatment effect. For trials in women in Africa, we didn't. I mean, we had, uh, you know, partners prep was positive and TDF2, I guess. Uh, but, you know, fem prep and voice and, and others were, were not. And so that didn't allow us to be able to have that non inferiority margin in women. And so because that's one reason we couldn't include them in the same trial. The other reason is, you know, going forward, maybe. It, 
able to include uh, MSM and women in the same trial with a, this newer trial design. Although, you know, the clinical trial sites are probably very different where you're going to find MSM, transgender women, and um, cisgender women who are at risk. So, I mean, I guess you could have these disparate clinical trial sites in one clinical trial, but, um, you know, wh where you reach these people are kind of in different areas. <laughs> um, so, it, it may be easier to have two separate trials, but, th that, but that's something totally up for discussion. Um, but, you know, so those, those are the two main main reasons. And, you know, if I had to do it over again, I wish I would have pushed harder or, you know, to, to say just, you know, just do this trial design, do a comparative trial design where everybody gets, you know, something. Either it would have been, you know, Discovery or Truvada. And, um, and that we use trial sites like ECHO and, it, you know, if everything comes in really low, you know, it's, you know, very likely that the drug was, drugs were causing that very low HIV serial conversion rate and then we would have had, had data. But, um, you know, I think this is evolving and sometimes you don't make progress until maybe you've had, you know, a real stark realization and a failure, uh, which I, I think at the end of the day, this was a, a failure of drug development. Mm -hmm. um, thanks. Thanks so much for that. And actually, um, before we sort of move on, because there are people I think who want to chime in and, and ask questions, I did, there are two kind of specific follow-up questions. Um, so the first one is, you know, you talked about kind of this, the kind of complexities of doing the, the, the statistical calculations around these trials and um, in, in trying to sort of unpack it, what we understand um, is that for developing the, the non-inferiority mar margin, they, they actually did include all trials in women, including voice and femprep. Um, but is that something where there's a little leeway and where there could be, um, you know, I mean, do, would those trials have to be included in, in, in that calculation? And is that potentially sort of a way around this? Um, so that's, that's one follow up. And then the second one is a little bit unrelated, but I think um, something we just probably should specifically ask is um, that there are actually federal regulations for, for you know, sex, sex, sex equity requirements. So I think that there's a lot of question around how Gilead actually kind of got away with putting forward this, this, um, this approval, approval plan that just didn't include women right off the bat. The two unrelated but follow-up questions. Um, okay, uh, wait, give me the, the last question again was Sorry. Um, so the last one was 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 just unrelated from the first one, but someone asked um, about the 1993 federal regulations for sex equity in in these in product development plans or in kind of you know research proposals for for products. And so I think just the question of how Gilead sort of got away with just excluding women um, from this product development package. Right, I, you know, I, I think the regula I have to go back and read the regulations, but I guess if you want an indication in women, um, yes, um, y you need to include them. I think it's possible even under the regulations, I guess, if, if you want an indication only in one gender, um, you can probably still do that. I know a lot of people aren't, aren't going to like to hear that. Now, I don't think that that was anybody's desire, really, to only have, you know, one, uh, you know, gender in the label. And I don't even think it was Gilead's. I think that they thought that they were going to honestly be able to make a, you know, pharmacokinetic, you know, extrapolation, um, which didn't really fly in front of the advisory committee. Um, I, I, the, the first question was um, about uh, not including the failed trials for calculating a non-inferiority margin. Well, I would be willing to discuss that with statisticians, but um, you really, you're really not supposed to cherry pick because you don't know if your new trial is going to be like the ones that failed or the ones that did well. 
And even if you did, Gilead had mentioned this, even if you only calculated your non-inferiority mile margin using the ones that were successful, <laughs> um, you're, you're still left with a very large trial, and they were th thinking of, you know, sample size calculations up to 15 to 20,000. And then, even if you did that, then you, because you cherry-picked your trials for the non-inferiority margin, um, is a non-inferiority trial really any better, or maybe maybe you should just use these external controls, like what what we're going to use anyway, if you're going to kind of, you know, Add add bias into your non inferior margin calculation. Just use external controls. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's what we were left with. So, I mean, you know, pe people have talked about that, and you know, we can still talk about that more. But I don't think you'll get a statistician to go along with that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Thank you so much. That's super helpful. Um, so I know we had, um, I believe it was Anna Forbes who wanted to, to chime in and ask a question. Levi, can you unmute her? Anna? Okay, can you all hear me? Yes, great. Hi, this is Anna Forbes. Um, thank you very much for uh, having this session and for uh, these two uh, excellent speakers. I had a question for Yvette. Um, well, two questions. One is, uh, have you, has your organization, uh, your advocacy group, had a direct conversation with Gilead about this yet? And that's one question. The second question is, uh, what time frame would you envision as realistic if Gilead is willing to back up and uh, have, a, have, that, have conversations with you and work directly with you uh, to make this trial go in the way that it should? Uh, thanks, thanks, Anna. Uh, we have APA has reached out to Gilead in South Africa to make the link with what's currently with regards to the study. So we are in discussion to have a meeting as soon as possible. We are not claiming to be representatives of all advocates, but we'd like Gilead to come on board and urgently convene a meeting with women of color women from South Africa and Africa uh, all together. So um, when it comes to timelines, we, we also understand the urgency and the need for this product, uh, for this research to happen and would like to support it. But uh, if it's going to happen in the timeline stipulated and that we're understanding within a, uh, within a month or a month and a half, engagement has to start now. It's important that we do community engagement in this what we see a child that sidelined women. So nothing would make sense unless we would say we actually engaged women initially in the trial. And I think Danielle Campbell is, is raising that. If engagement with women happened initially, it would have been okay. So if we're planning to have the study in the next few months, uh, two months or uh, one and a half months, engagement needs to start ASAP. And I'm sorry, let me just ask one, one more thing. Um, I'm not sure I completely understood you, Yvette. Uh, has there been direct communication with Gilead uh, at this point and have they responded to you or not? Uh, we are in, uh, in discussion on times that is best suitable for us, but also understanding that this discussion needs to happen. We're pushing to have a discussion with Gilead ASAP, like I said, with the South Africa office, but also that we urge that there is a bigger engagement with women who are affected by HIV, uh, you know, globally. So yeah, we, we are, they are, yes, we are in discussion. <laughs> Let's okay. just say we have sent an email. Right, thank you very much. Great, uh, I think that that's, that's super helpful and thanks for, um, thanks for getting down to those brass, brass tacks. Um, Anna. Um, I also, I, I wanted to sort of continue a little bit on this, on this thread. And I think one thing that, that has come up, but really occurred to me as, as you were both speaking is that, um, Jeff, I think your presentation just, you know, it's something that those of us who have been following us, following this closely are, you know, can kind of, can take in and kind of unpack and understand. And, but it's, it's, 
you know, as you even mentioned at the end, it's a lot. <laughs> and it's, it's really technical. And you start talking about these, um, these, you know, indexes and different statistical calculations. Um, you know, and I think that we have been really looking at this just in terms of the growing complexity of HIV prevention trials and even starting with this idea of kind of superiority and non-inferiority trials and how um, these things are oftentimes, I think, difficult for communities to understand. Not that it's difficult for them to understand the concepts in and of themselves once you unpack them, um, but I think that they can be, um, I think they can be sort of challenging to kind of take in, especially in communities, for instance, um, like in South Africa, where there is a lot of effort going on just to roll out oral Truvada at the moment um, and sort of trying to understand how these kind of trials of next generation products sort of fit into that context. And if that, I'm, I just wondered if you could comment a little bit on, you know, if you have any sort of suggestions of how do we sort of navigate that scenario? How do we help communities? And I think you know, maybe this, the meeting that you held last week was, was a really good example of that. But are there kind of specific recommendations that you can make for product developers and other trial groups who want to implement these new trials and how they should be sort of communicated, I guess, to, um, to the communities where they'll be conducted and to, to broader advocates in civil society? So thanks, Stacy. These, these trials are usually very politically charged in South Africa, and everyone who's worked in South Africa knows that. And I think from from beginning the partic uh, the participation of advocates, and also having a session where it's a roundtable and meeting to make advocates understand the complexity. So as um, my comrade Alia was presenting, uh, I was like, now I have to go and do homework and make sure I, res I represent my community well and I understand every nuance and in uh, detail of this trial. So one of the big things, one of the ways of navigating that is an earlier on, early on meeting with advocates to unpack this trial. We, we have examples with the ECHO trial, which at the beginning looked like it was the most complex trial and advocates would not understand it. But what the ECHO trial did was include us and start that capacity building. So giving us enough information to understand the trial and translate it the way we understand it for us to start talking to our communities and the advocacy for at the end, the end dream of having these products in our hands. So we do not want another situation where we are part of a trial, advocate for a trial, but the product never reaches the hand of a, of, of a woman in Africa, a woman of color, a black woman. So when we start, that engagement needs to start with that. Engage women, but also empower us with understanding the signs, like we've done with all of the other all of the other trials. Advocates has always been part of it, and we'd like to engage, but we also need capacity building. And those are some of the things that trials and product developers struggle to do because it's not cheap and it's also not easy. It won't happen overnight. We need that capacity building to happen. Great. Yeah, no, I, that's helpful. And I think that there are some, some, especially in this scenario, there are some specific kind of actions, actions there to take. Um, and maybe just Jeff, kind of the flip side of it, would love to hear your take on this. And, um, and actually to ask specifically, does the FDA require community input? Is there sort of a mechanism that, that you all look for, you know, again, kind of a given, a, a certain requirement that you have? Um, and, and thinking about community or sort of civil society kind of advocacy input, but also thinking about other stakeholders um, in the process and specifically kind of other regulators and what the sort of conversations are um, between the FDA and, and some of the other global regulators, um, you know, uh, for instance, SAPRA in South Africa, um, or kind of the EMA in Europe. So that's um, a two-parter for you, yeah. Uh, so no, we, we are having conversations with other regulators, EMA in South Africa, and um, you know, we're also in some you know, working groups externally um, uh, having conversations with them. So both through our internal channels and in working groups, we're interacting with the regulators. And um, so as far as requirement for community engagement, there's no, um, you know, regulation 
requirement means translation or, you know, must or shall. There's n n n that's not written down. But, I mean, you, you know, it's highly encouraged, and it's really at this, you know, the sponsor's risk if they don't engage the community because the trial will fail. And this is a perfect example because if this trial is done in South Africa and – the participants in the community is not on board, it will fail because if, you know, the community doesn't like what we're serving <laughs> here in this trial and, uh, and there's, you know, poor adherence to, you know, both arms and you have a serial conversion rate of around two <laughs> or something, it will be un uninterpretable, this new design. So this new design kind of is based on that we're going to have really high efficacy in a in a high HIV incidence population. So uh, engagement is a must, and I would appreciate any kind of way to translate some of these um, harder statistical concepts, or to you know un unpack all, unpack it, boil it down. So. Um, you know, it's understandable to the community, you know, you know, what we're doing here. I mean, so far, my mission has been to uh, try to get a trial design that will be convincing to advisory committees, treatment guideline panels, academicians that we've had a satisfactory, evidence-based, robust clinical investigation that, you know, demonstrates efficacy. And... Um, you know, while that's being done, I think we need to, you know, translate, <laughs> you know, what we're trying to do so, you know, everyone can understand it in their own terms. Um, no, I, I mean, I think you're just sort of hitting on, hitting on a point that there's really a lot to tackle here. And um, I think we just appreciate sort of your recognition of, um, of, of all of these all of these different things that, that need to be done. Um, and I do think that there's, uh, there is sort of a, a, a way that's being paved, I think, to kind of help do all of that translation, but also help move these trials forward um, as, as, they need to, as they need to be in sort of an efficient way. Um, so really looking forward to, to all of that. I realize we're getting at um, to the top of the hour, but I just kind of on that note, I, I thought maybe we would sort of wrap up by um, thinking kind of about the future. There were a couple of questions that came in about, um, you know, future future access. Um, you know, I think Yvette mentioned that I think one of the things that advocates are gonna be paying a lot of attention to in the conduct of this trial is, is sort of this issue around post-trial access, but just future plans for, for FTAP in a country like South Africa. Um, and how do we, you know, what's the sort of reality around that? There was also a question around whether or not Discovy um, on demand is, is gonna be studied or um, given, you know, the, especially given the, the recent WHO guidance on um, on on-demand prep for, for MSM. Um, and also, Jeff, I, I would just love to kind of hear your thoughts on sort of just in general kind of the future of HIV prevention trials or, you know, um, you know next generation prep product trials. Um, and if you kind of feel like this is sort of a, a way forward and a way that we can um, sort of ensure that, that we don't end up where we are kind of today with FTAF again um, with, with these sort of partial labels? <clears throat> well, I think the future is set. We're uh, all going to have to be a little bit more flexible and innovative and um, probably go out on a, a limb like this in some different trial designs because if we just try to put it in the old box, um, we'll end up like we have for Discovy and, you know, there will be a missing, missing piece. And um, I think, you know, we were demanding perf perfection or, you know, and, um, you know, if it couldn't be achieved, we, we didn't do anything. Um, so that, that was, so the, the future will be, um, I don't think it will be just one type of trial design. It will be a couple different types of trial design, but they're going to have to be a little bit different. And, um, 
you know, we're probably going to have to uh, use kind of a composite of approaches, you know, have external controls as backups and um, try to do superiority when possible. Um, so I, th I think that's kind of the, the future. Um, hopefully we could marry this to uh, methods for determining HIV incidence in the population. Um, so we can, you know, once we get all of our prevention tools, we'll be able to find the hot spots and then, you know, implement the prevention program. So the same tool that we need to do trials determining HIV incidence is the same tool that you need tool that you need to control the epidemic. And that's why I'm intrigued by something like these recency assays, which you, you can you can get a you know estimate of of that <clears throat> you you know using blood tests without having to follow people you know longitudinally. <clears throat> Great. Um, well, it sounds like sounds super challenging, but 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 exciting. Um, and again, I, we're really getting to the top of the hour, but of that I did want to give you um, a chance to sort of say any any final words. I, I, I think, uh, thanks, Stacy. I think more importantly for advocates, and I cannot reiterate this enough, and I think I might sound like a broken record, but I know policymakers, uh, you know, design a trial, <laughs> trial sites and, and, and usually forget. Women should be at the center of this trial. We should start thinking around how we're going to engage communities as we start thinking about how are we going to basically engage advocates who are not connected to any uh, uh, Gilead or the trial site to actually be part of a global and a local um, advisory board for us to have this trial have some kind of um, validity or can I, can I say that in our communities where we feel okay to advocate for this trial to happen one and for the product to become available in our countries. That's great. Thanks, Yvette. And I know that um, there, there have been some other questions that, that have popped up in the, in the, the chat function kind of around um, around uh, just these sort of engagement mechanisms. And I think, you know, one thing to really say from the outset is that the, you know, I think the field of biomedical HIV prevention has a really good track record of community engagement. And, and, and there really have, there, and there are a lot of efforts and, and um, to, to meaningfully engage communities, especially communities around the, the trial site. And I think, um, what we're experiencing here, again, in this sort of new era of trial design getting more more complicated, and especially in this scenario where there is a lot of question and frustration around why, um, you know, why we are sort of in this a bit of a, a predicament. Um, you know, I think that we're going to have to take a real careful look at what those engagement mechanisms look like and their their sort of effectiveness. Um, you know, and, 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 and a lot of people, I think, have a lot of different experiences and some of those have, have come up in the, in the chat function. And so maybe we can sort of call on ourselves as sort of a, um, a global community of, of advocates, because I think we really are all advocates for, for moving this research forward to kind of really take a hard look at, at what is going to work and, and what maybe won't work. I mean, as you started out is that in your, in your um, talking points. So, um, Thank you for, for all of that. So um, I do, I recognize, I think that there may have been a little glitch in that this, the, um, the, the actual meeting invite was, was scheduled until 11.15, but we do unfortunately have to, to wrap it up now. Um, but I, I wanted to just sort of highlight, we had a, a, a question come in about sort of drug levels and, um, and, and, and how they relate to calculating efficacy. And I do want to sort of table that. We're going to have a call um, on Friday to look specifically at those sort of PKPD issues. Um, and so we will, we will keep that question for Friday and, and that will be a time to, 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 to get a lot of more information about that. Um, so hopefully, so hope everyone will, will tune into that. It's Friday at um, 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. So unfortunately that's, um, that's late for our colleagues in, in Africa and, and, and further east. Um, but it will be, will be recorded as all of these are. So, um, 
we're really committed to getting this information out. Again, keep questions coming to us, you know, via email. Um, you know, all of us, you know how to get to us. Um, and, and we will keep this all flowing. I did want to sort of, um, you know, I, I just also highlight that, you know, this, um, these issues around trial design, and I think, Jeff, what you really brought up around how it's, um, there really isn't, you know, everyone, everyone in our field is grappling with this and there's not really sort of a right, a right or a wrong way forward. Um, and, and, and so I think that this is going to be, a, this is a focus for, for our field. Um, and did want to highlight also that UNAIDS is having a meeting next week um, that's going to look specifically at the ethical considerations for biomedical HIV prevention trials, sort of in the light of, um, of next generation trials and whether or not those considerations need to be um, revised and, and will be a, a, a careful review of that. So we're looking forward to hearing kind of the outcomes. Um, also want, just wanted to mention that um, Jeff, you, you know this because you've been in, involved with this, but AVAC has started um, a, an effort around really kind of building capacity for advocates around these issues of, of trial design concepts, next generation trial design concepts. In September, we had an initial sort of um, uh, kind of a, a teach in on these concepts to kind of begin to to really develop a cadre of, um, of advocates who are very engaged in this and can really help I think trialists, regulators, statisticians that, you know, kind of think through these issues and help them understand what is going to be kind of acceptable to communities and, and what will make these trials successful. So, um, and we're excited to build on that and know that there are a lot of other efforts going on around this. I think TAG, um, in partnership with the HVTN and BAI, just released um, a survey around these issues, thinking specifically about the Mosaic O trial that's, that um, is, is, uh, is, is underway um, and is another sort of complex trial design um, of, of a vaccine. So, um, so I think just to say, um, <laughs> we can't answer all questions in an hour and that this conversation, it really will be ongoing. So um, we're looking forward to that and just thank, um, thank you, Jeff and Yvette. Again, this is just really an amazing combination between the two of you and um, thanks everyone for joining and we will talk to you soon. My pleasure. Thanks.